Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to Water Wednesday Ask Extension. So you may notice we have a new format of Water Wednesday. The first Wednesday of each month, we add this new segment called Ask Extension. So the idea of for Water Wednesday Ask Extension, I know most of you already feel so probably a little bit Zoom fatigue and too many webinars. So we do not want to do formal webinars. I just want to utilize uh, this segment uh, just to chat with you. So we want to know what you wonder about Florida's water resources, uh, what questions you may have, and we are here to uh, answer your questions. And uh, today and uh, this month, the theme, the theme is stall water. And we have our guest speaker, Dr. Reisinger. She, he is the state specialist uh, of, uh, in soil and the water science department. And even I've been doing Facebook Live for over a, month, a year. I still feel nervous every time I face the camera. So I realized I didn't even introduce myself. So hi, everyone here. So if it's your first time turning to Facebook Live, well, uh, my name is uh, Yiling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources uh, Regional Specialized Agent in UF IFS Extension in Central District. So like I mentioned, uh, we've been doing Water Wednesday series of for over a year and recently we add this uh, new segment called uh, Water Wednesday Ask Extension. So let me introduce uh, today's uh, guest speaker, Dr. Reisinger. Thanks, Elan, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to spend, I know we don't want to do a full on formal webinar and nobody wants to sit through a whole hour presentation right now. But I do want to talk a little bit just to give a very brief 10 to 15 minute presentation on stormwater ponds, kind of a general overview um, to make sure that we're all kind of starting on the same page. Uh, and then after that, we can open this up for questions from the audience and hopefully I can answer all your questions. So one second, I will share my screen and then we will go from there. Okay, let's do this and it's going to take me a second here. Okay, Yilin, can you see my PowerPoint? Looks good. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, just get reorganized here a little bit. All right, so uh, like I said, or like Yilin said, and uh, I followed up, my name is AJ Reisinger. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida based out of Gainesville. I'm in the soil and water sciences department. And I'm a research and extension specialist focused on urban water quality. Uh, I work with urban streams, urban wetlands, and what we're going to be talking about here today, stormwater ponds and urban stormwater. So the little presentation I'm going to give you is something that I've actually presented at a few different conferences as well. And it's called a blessing and a curse. Stormwater ponds provide multiple positive and negative effects in urban watersheds. Um, and I like to to give this presentation because it talks about some of the, the good and the bad and a little bit of the ugly uh, related to stormwater ponds. So let's go ahead. Okay, cool. All right. And before we even talk about the ponds themselves, let's talk a little bit about stormwater and why and how we manage it. Uh, if you take a really long-term perspective and think about how humans have impacted the environment uh, over the duration of human history, Altered stormwater is, an altered stormwater runoff is probably one of, if not the oldest human impacts on the environment um, out of anything that we've done. It's basically the first time that a person built a roof over their head or even put a, a rock over their head to stop rain from hitting them. They were changing how rainwater interacted with the landscape. And that change of that rainwater alters how the water moves across the landscape and shifts things from infiltrating into the groundwater and instead causes, uh, causes stormwater to run off the surface of the landscape. And so we've been altering stormwater for quite a long time. And one of the main ways we do that these days is by increasing the amount of impervious surfaces on the landscape. So these are things like roads and buildings, sidewalks, parking lots, anything that um, is basically a solid surface that doesn't allow water to, to move through into the soil. And instead it causes that water to shift laterally and run off the surface of the landscape. 
this increasing urbanization and increased impervious surfaces leads to what we call flashy hydrographs. So that's just a fancy term for we get really rapid and large flood events in urban watersheds because instead of some of that rainwater uh, leaching into the ground, percolating into the groundwater, all of that rainwater runs off into surface pathways like streams and lakes. And so all of that water will move downstream and can cause a flood event. Also with the surface water runoff of, of stormwater, you get anything that was on the land is going to dissolve into the water and move with it. And so that leads to pollutant loading into our downstream ecosystems. <clears throat> and finally, by uh, paving paradise and putting up a parking lot for better, for lack of a better term, we are altering the, the connectivity of habitats across the landscape, both terrestrial and aquatic, but we're really changing how animals and uh, plants can move across the landscape and how they can interact with different habitats. So the ways that we kind of deal with these issues, there's a, there's a variety of different ways that we deal with these issues. Uh, first and foremost, state and federal regulations basically say that you have to do something to mitigate the impacts of altered stormwater whenever you're doing a development. So there are rules that when you develop a landscape, you have to have no net change of the hydrological impact. So you don't want to have increased flooding downstream. So we have to implement these altered uh, stormwater management approaches in our development plans. Stormwater ponds are probably the most common practice to reduce these impacts on downstream ecosystems. They're really good at flood control. So they capture all of this surface water runoff that runs across the landscape. And instead of routing it directly into your nearby creek, those stormwater ponds will capture all of that rainwater and slowly let it trickle downstream. And so it kind of flattens the curve, for lack of a better term, and, and allows that, that surface water runoff to slowly move downstream instead of this really rapid flood event. Stormwater ponds are also expected to remove pollutants like nutrients, sediment, and other things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, this uh, figure or this table that you see right here with the red highlight, this is about a 10 year old survey of stormwater managers across the United States that asked them what their what the most important approaches for managing stormwater were in their urban areas. And so across the entire country, stormwater wet ponds are the most important approach for uh, managing stormwater. There's also things like uh, grass swales or infiltration or constructed wetlands. There's a wide variety of approaches, but stormwater ponds are incredibly common across the country. And if we look here in the state of Florida, we are probably leading the way in terms of stormwater ponds. This map on the left is a figure that we actually put together in a paper that we published last year, where we quantified the total number of stormwater ponds throughout the state of Florida. So we used some uh, mapping approaches and some uh, various satellite imagery to estimate the number of stormwater ponds in the state. Every single blue dot on here represents a single individual stormwater pond. There's a lot of dots on here. There's actually more than 75,000 dots on here because that's how many stormwater ponds we estimate to be in the state of Florida. The gray areas are urban or urbanized areas uh, on the state and green are the less developed, more preserved or agricultural areas in the state. And this, this plot on the left here shows the total surface area of various different land uses in the state of Florida. And we see the stormwater ponds, there's actually more surface area in the state of Florida as stormwater ponds than there is as industrial land uses. So they are a really uh, important component of our landscape. And so we want to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how we can make them better. To, to zoom in even more locally, this is a Google Maps or Google Earth image of the city of Gainesville and greater Alachua County. So if you look closely, this is I-75. This is Lake Alice. This is uh, Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. My house is somewhere out here. So that's just, this is what an overhead view of Gainesville looks like. And we can superimpose all the stormwater ponds from the, from the county. So based on county estimates, there's around eight to 900 stormwater ponds within uh, Alachua County. And not only do we have a lot of stormwater ponds, 
we also have this crazy underground and above ground network of pipes and ditches and drains that connect our landscape to these stormwater ponds. So we're not only building stormwater ponds, but we're plumbing our, our urban environments in a way such that we, we discharge all of our stormwater directly to these ponds as fast as we can. So we have various expectations of what we think stormwater ponds should do. And these expectations sort of differ between if you live by a pond or if you're talking about ponds in general. So at the societal level or regulatory officials or maybe technical engineers, they expect stormwater ponds to control flooding and prevent downstream flooding. First, foremost, uh, period, dot, end, over. That's what we want stormwater ponds to do. That's how they've been designed for the past 40 years or at least or more. More recently, there's been more of a focus on adding in water quality benefits into these stormwater ponds as well, uh, implementing alternative design strategies to promote sediment settling, nutrient retention, trash accumulation, that sort of thing. But these are the two main things we think stormwater ponds should do at a societal level. They should control flooding and they should improve downstream water quality or at least protect it. But if you ask somebody that lives by a stormwater pond, which uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Monahan, and some of his students did in a paper they published about five years ago, the local residents, they, they recognize that flood control is the most important thing for stormwater ponds. They fully understand that's why we build them. It's really good that uh, local residents recognize this. Their second most important concern for stormwater ponds is they want their pond to increase their property value. So they want their pond to look good so that their house is worth more money. Makes sense. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like it if my house was worth more money as well. They want open water views because they think that this is one of the main aesthetic amenities or main benefits of stormwater ponds is being able to see the water. They want wildlife habitat for things like fish and birds and turtles and other things like that. And then finally, the fifth highest rated expectation is they want downstream water quality benefits. So the residents, local residents do recognize that ponds might have these other functions for downstream water quality, but they don't really identify it as a priority. So this is where these kind of changing or altering expectations are really fundamental to, to understanding how and why we perceive and manage these ponds differently if we really want to make sure we get the, the best and the most out of our stormwater ponds locally. So I'm going to jump into a few of these different uh, benefits or processes that we expect from stormwater ponds to see how good they really are. Oh, this uh, figure should not have jumped in so early, sorry. Let's just look up here at the top right. Um, we ask our ponds, uh, do they protect downstream water quality? Well, we know that they're pretty good at removing sediments and they're pretty good at removing phosphorus. So this figure at the top right is from a 2007 survey of stormwater ponds throughout the state of Florida. And they found that uh, stormwater ponds that held water for at least like a week would remove anywhere from about 70 to 90 percent of the total phosphorus that comes into the pond. So this is based on what they export to downstream ecosystems. We know that they're not very good at removing nitrogen though. And oh crud, I popped out or I removed that figure. Um, but to Matt, so I just changed these slides right before I got onto this presentation, so I must have messed up my animations. But imagine a figure up here that's the same as this phosphorus figure, but for nitrogen, this plateaus out at about 45%. So regardless of how long you hold onto the water, you're only removing less than half of the nitrogen that comes in uh, from stormwater runoff. But what I was showing down here in this is figure at the bottom is results that we just published from a former grad student in my lab who just finished with his master's. We found that ponds uh, get better at removing nitrogen and improving downstream water quality as they age. So older ponds, moving from left to right here, we see that older ponds remove more nitrogen, particularly in Gainesville, where we allow a little bit more natural ecological development to happen in the ponds that we studied here. If we manage the ponds really intensely, like the Miami neighborhood where we sampled our ponds uh, for the study, you don't get the same uh, accumulation of benefits as ponds age. We also know that ponds are sources of carbon to the atmosphere. So if we're thinking in terms of climate change, this is an important thing to consider. We have uh, some recent work by a PhD student in my lab, Audrey Geckner, who looked at carbon burial, showed here in pink, and carbon gas emission shown here in blue. 
uh, in stormwater ponds in uh, Bradenton, Florida. And she found that ponds, uh, the burial of carbon shown in pink increases with pond age. So that we get better at storing carbon with older ponds. But the gas emissions uh, shown in blue again, also that decreases with pond age. So ponds store more and export less as they get older. So this means that as ponds get older, they actually become or approach a net benefit in terms of greenhouse gases and climate change. But early on in their careers, the first 20 years of their life, it appears that ponds are major sources of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So that's a, that's a curse uh, from the pond perspective. Stormwater ponds also uh, are kind of habitat refuges on these urban landscapes that are devoid of aquatic habitat. So there's a lot of plants and animals that need wetlands, that need ponds, that need lakes to survive. Either that's where they live or they're migrating across the state and they need some aquatic habitat to land on like waterfowl that are migrating. Stormwater ponds are actually great places for that to happen. They, they provide this great habitat refuge that can really enhance local and regional biodiversity. And we know that our pond management can alter this biodiversity as well. So if you look at stormwater ponds that are either highly managed with turf grass mown all the way up to the edge, uh, semi-managed, so some intentional plant management and some turf grass, or if ponds are just left to grow kind of wild, um, you'll find different macroinvertebrate or bug communities within these ponds and different levels of biodiversity. And we know that this is driven by our management of aquatic vegetation, as well as the organic matter in the ponds themselves and the oxygen available. But uh, a lot of species and being habitat for species isn't always a good thing. Stormwater ponds are also a great place for invasive species to survive and thrive. Uh, they receive non-native seeds and other, other um, sources of non-native species from the landscape. There's a lot of nutrients and a lot of disturbance in these ponds, which is great for invasive species, and they're connected really broadly. So if you asked an invasive species ecologist how to uh, let invasive species really go crazy, this is what they would say. This is exactly what stormwater ponds have. And we find a lot of invasive species in stormwater ponds. More than 90% of the surveyed ponds we, we measured in this study right here, where we look at invasive plant species richness um, as they increase with management intensity, more than 90% of our ponds that we surveyed had at least one invasive plant, but the degree of management intensity affected invasive richness. So more managed ponds had fewer invasive species likely because the managers were probably using some herbicide to basically kill everything that wasn't turf grass. Um, that's based on our management intensity uh, gradient. So that's kind of all I really wanna say here for this uh, presentation, but just wanna summarize that stormwater ponds are a blessing and a curse. Um, we build them to prevent downstream flooding and they're pretty good at that. They're, we're pretty good at engineering them for a water conservation, uh, water quantity preservation perspective. They also can provide habitat for native plants and animals, and they can reduce pollutant export, particularly for sediment and phosphorus. But we also know that they're refuge for invasive species. There's a lot of invasive plant species in these stormwater ponds. They're a carbon source to the atmosphere, at least for um, most of their lifespan. They're not perfect at removing nitrogen, and they can also be a home for various chemical treatments uh, to enhance aesthetic amenities desired by the local community. So we need a lot more research and a lot more extension outreach interaction to better understand these impacts and how our perceptions, our wants, and our desires for stormwater ponds, how those interact with the, the services that they're providing for us on the landscape. So that's all I've got. Um, you can contact me via email or on Twitter if you have any other questions after today's Q&A. But uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up to the, the Q&A portion of this presentation and happy to talk about anything you're interested in. Thanks a lot. Thank you, AJ, that was great. Uh, I do have a question. I think probably our attendees are wondering the same question. Why the performance change with the age of the pond? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're still, we don't know for sure, but we have a few hypotheses. So one thing is that if you think about 
a storm water pond and how it's constructed. They're usually holes that are dug out of the landscape and the soil that's dug out is often used for the developments for developing the, the residential homes uh, in the watershed. And so it's kind of just this uh, barren, sterile soil that you dig out and then you let water fill in. So at the start of uh, a pond's lifespan, it doesn't have a really large microbial community. It doesn't have a lot, a lot or many plants unless you're planting them yourselves. It, there isn't a lot of organic matter in the sediments, that sort of thing. And just due to natural processes that occur over time, you get this accumulation of organic matter in the sediment. You get plants that start to grow in there. You get um, a more diverse biological community. And that is our kind of expectation for why we think they're capable of um, basically responding to pollutant inputs and removing nitrogen um, better as they get older. Great. So the power of mother nature. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to get too much details, but I do wonder, I see some questions here, because the one diagram you show in Gainesville, so the performance does mm -hmm. increase with age, yep. but in Miami, yep. You don't see the big difference. Mm -hmm. Any hypothesis related? To yeah, that? yeah. So that's a great question. And so that was um, that project was a really interesting one because we wanted to just focus on the age gradient, right? We wanted to make it. That was the one question that we had, but we wanted to make sure we did the study in Gainesville and Miami because it's important to look at different parts of the state to see how they're functioning differently. And what we didn't think to account for before actually doing the study was that there's also different perspectives and management, both regionally as well as locally or within communities. So the Miami ponds were all within one single um, master planned community that was heavily managed, heavily maintained. All of the ponds were dredged, or maybe not, I guess I can't say dredged regularly, but they had the appearance that they had been dredged um, because there was less organic matter in the pond sediments. And they also had no riparian vegetation around the edges of the ponds. So there were no plants uh, growing on the banks. There were no plants growing within the ponds as well. Um, and then we contrast that with our Gainesville ponds that we, we tried to have tried to identify a similar community in Gainesville to do a study so that we could control for that. But people in Gainesville didn't want us to, to be studying their ponds. So eventually we got permission from the city of Gainesville to work in stormwater ponds within city parks. And so city park stormwater ponds are managed a little bit differently than in a residential community um, because the city isn't managing them for clear water views or for uh, aesthetic purposes. They just want to make sure that they're capturing the runoff water. And so those Gainesville ponds, there is a lot of littoral vegetation. There is a lot of submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, and there is vegetation along the banks. So we think, again, that it's this, this mother nature, this biological processing that's uh, kind of allowing for that improvement over time in Gainesville, whereas the management of the ponds in Miami potentially could have been kind of stopping Mother Nature from doing what it wanted to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's not just the pond, it's not just the age, it's multiple factors, like how you manage yeah. the pond. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I do have, I see some questions here. So how can we distinguish, because the way you drive around, you see a lot of ponds. So how mm -hmm. can we distinguish it's a stormwater pond and it's a natural pond? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I would say just, just looking at a pond, it, it can be somewhat difficult sometimes, but I would imagine that if you're driving on a major road in Florida and you see a pond, it's probably a man-made pond. Maybe not directly a stormwater pond, but it's probably been at least um, modified by some human activities. If you actually get out of your car and go and walk by the water body and take a look at it, there are a few things that you can kind of keep an eye out for to, to, that are kind of uh, telltale signs of something being a stormwater pond. Usually stormwater ponds, not always, but usually stormwater ponds will have some sort of input, inflow and outflow structures. So if there's like a 
a concrete uh, pillar in the middle of a pond with a grate on it, that's usually what, that's what's called an overflow structure. So if the pond fills up too high above that grate, it'll start draining and move to the next part of the stormwater system. You can also look in the pond to see if there are any pipes coming into the pond, because most, like I showed in that map with all the pipes all around Gainesville, um, most stormwater ponds will have pipes coming into them from the surrounding communities. If you don't have those, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a stormwater pond. Um, it might be that the stormwater pond was built just with natural topography, but those are kind of some of the main telltale signs of a, of a pond. Yeah, because sometimes you just glance it, it may be hard to tell. It's yeah, a, yeah. You just see the water body. And another question is also related to that. Uh, so we see some ponds, they are always wet, and some ponds, sometimes they are dry. So the term is a one is called detention pond, another is called the retention pond. So why we have two different type of designs? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's wet ponds and there's dry ponds. There's detention ponds and there's retention ponds. There can be wet detention. There can be wet retention. There can be dry detention and dry retention. Um, and depending on where you're located in the world or in the country, definitions change a little bit too. Uh, in a lot of the country, people think that dry ponds are always detention and wet ponds are always retention. But that's kind of the opposite in Florida. And a lot of that has to do with the, just the natural hydrology and geology of our systems. So you can think of detention ponds as um, detention in school means you get held after class. Uh, but then eventually you get let go, um, let to go home. And re retention, if you get retained in school, that usually you can think of that as being held back for a year, like you have to repeat the fourth grade or something. And so that's a much longer holding back. And so a de detention pond is meant to capture water and then slowly let it trickle out to the next downstream ecosystem, whether that's another stormwater pond or a natural stream or a natural lake or the ocean. Um, it's, it's designed to do that slowly over time. Whereas a retention pond is meant to capture all of the water that comes into it and hold it on site or push it down to the groundwater. And so here in Florida, uh, depending on where you're at, like in North and Central Florida, we have a lot of karst geology, which allows for groundwater to rapidly, or for surface water to rapidly drain into groundwater. And so that allows for a lot of stormwater retention because from a stormwater perspective, if something goes into the groundwater, it's considered permanently removed or retained. And so that's why we have dry retention ponds in Florida because water will come in and then it'll go down and then the, the pond will go dry. Um, wet ponds are much more common in South Florida and Southwest Florida where there isn't that as much karst geology and there's um, also a higher water table. And so those ponds, um, often will will not drain entirely and they're meant to be wet year round. That hopefully answers the question. And I, your dis the decision on what type of a pond you use, because um, I think that was part of the question, sorry. It's usually not a choice that you, it's, it's not like you choose to do one or the other usually, usually it's based on the site that you have. Um, so if you have the geology, like I think that from a water quality perspective, most people would prefer to have dry ponds in Florida, dry retention ponds, um, because that prevents pollutants from moving down to your surface water streams and going downstream further. Um, but sometimes that's just not possible. And so, and so you also can be limited by space you have available, how deep you want to dig your ponds, because that'll depend on if it's going to be wet or dry, that sort of thing as well. So it's really just multiple factors. It's not one cut for all. It depends yeah. on the topography, geography, mm -hmm. and also yeah, other factors. Uh, and I see another question. It's also similar to that one. Is, uh, is that usually like you have to have one stormwater pond in the neighborhood because for mm -hmm. flood control? Yeah, you, you don't have to have a stormwater pond in your neighborhood. Um, and if you live in an older neighborhood, you probably don't, or you might not. Um, I can't remember, I'm not a 
I'm not going to get into the specific policy and legal acts that have happened because I don't know those exactly off the top of my head, so I don't want them to speak. But there are state and federal regulations that require management of stormwater during uh, construction of new developments, but those are fairly new regulations, like within the last 30, 40 years. And so like older communities uh, often do not have stormwater ponds. Um, but you can also manage stormwater through other approaches instead of stormwater ponds. So you can have um, a lot of really small rain gardens that are, that are interspersed all throughout your neighborhood that capture the same total volume as a, storm, as a big stormwater pond, but uh, they're more distributed. You can um, reduce stormwater runoff by having more pervious pavement and other pervious structures in your landscape instead of uh, building one single large pond. We actually, um, a lot of the more low impact development strategies are trying to move away from large ponds and neighborhoods and towards some of these smaller distributed practices to kind of spread the load throughout the landscape. Good, because I saw this comment. Uh, that's actually, I wonder too. So uh, just a quick comment on that. Uh, just your comment, older neighborhood, they don't usually have a uh, stormwater pond. That's what I saw one neighborhood in Miami, actually one homeowner contact me. So we look at the Google map, we didn't see any stormwater pond mm -hmm. and we didn't see any swell either. That's because the, uh, the reason she contacted us is uh, she got a constant flooding in the house. Uh, and the house is also below, it has a basement. So every time there's a rain event, her house is flooded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then we look at that like, oh, it doesn't have stormwater pond and doesn't have this uh, like yeah. swell, like you said, other uh, practices. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And, and that's really hard because if you've already, if your neighborhood, if your community has already developed pre stormwater regulations, um, mm -hmm. It's super hard and expensive to go in and try to retrofit that community and change your processes or change your dynamics. Um, we there are some ways to do that, but they're not cheap and they're not uh, easy to get everybody to buy into. Yeah, right. That's that's a good point. And I saw one comment I do want to share with everyone here. It's, uh, we had a small gator swim up a drainage pop, uh, pipe from the lake into the fence, the pond in front of the high school. Yeah. So I think when I was living in like, uh, my old neighborhood, we got that lake really like over mm -hmm. water view. That's, we usually see gators a yeah. lot. Is that common in Florida? I had to yeah. ask. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, the UF, we're UF Gators for a reason. Um, yeah, I think that uh, stormwater ponds are, yeah, their habitat for, and, and like, also if you think about it, we've gotten rid of a lot of the natural wetlands and swamps and things, and we're replacing them with these stormwater ponds. And so alligators and, other, and snakes and other things, they will, will be, or they can be in basically any water that, that is in Florida. I'd be careful, for sure. <laughs> So another question is also related to that. So, uh, that, that probably will be our last question. So, cause we see this open water, especially these uh, big lakes. So we usually say people fish there. So some questions I was asked a, a few times, it's uh, can we eat the fish there? Is that safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would not recommend it probably. Um, I mean, I can't, so without knowing specifics about an individual pond and what it drains and what's in the landscape, I can't say 100% for sure if something's safe or not. But like when it comes to human health and uh, what you eat and what you consume, I generally tend to be a little conservative and, and try to be on the safe side of not recommending eating things if, I'm, if they're questionable. And if you think about what stormwater ponds are designed to capture. They're designed to capture the like motor oil that spills on your driveway or the paint that somebody dumped on the road because they were too lazy to figure out how to actually properly dispose of it. Uh, the pesticides that run off your landscape, the fertilizer, the heavy metals that are in that construction facility of the industrial neighborhood nearby. Like it's possible that those aren't going to be problematic, but like I wouldn't 
wouldn't count on it. And so I would definitely not recommend consuming anything uh, that you get out of a stormwater pond. I wouldn't recommend swimming in stormwater ponds, um, mostly just from, not necessarily from the chemical hazards, but just additional safety concerns, gators. And sometimes these ponds are really steep and really deep and they can be dangerous as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, besides the risk of uh, bioaccumulation and it's mm -hmm. also other factors, especially we see like gators uh, swimming up yeah. through yeah. the drainage pipe. We do yeah. want to be more cautious. Yeah. Great. Uh, let me check my Facebook again, see if we have any questions. Uh, I see a lot of comments. It's a very uh, informative uh, presentation and you covered a lot of great um, Cover great, uh, covered a lot of great information. Yeah, I see some com compliments here. And thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for watching today's The Water Wednesday Ask Extension. So if you have more questions or you are watching the recording, you can put your question in the chat box. And I will also leave Dr. Reisinger's email in the chat box. If you want, you can also reach out to him for any questions you may have. With that, we appreciate AJ for your time, for the informative talk, and also all the great answers to our questions. And also hope everyone have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. And bye now. Thank you.